I want to thank my friend Brayden for voicing Old Man Consequences in the opening. I used to keep Brayden up to 3 in the morning some nights years ago, teaching him FNAF lore, but I knew I wanted him to be part of this finale in some way. Anyways, on December 4th, 2017, history was made in the FNAF community. Not only did we unexpectedly get a new mainline game, but furthermore, Scott did something with it nobody would have expected. He gave the story an ending. Of course, in typical FNAF fashion, being the end is only a temporary title. A little while after FNAF 6 was left to marinate in the community, Scott announced his plan for a giant custom night, originally planned out 40 characters before that number was bumped up to 50, and then even more than that later on. Originally, the game was supposed to be a free DLC to FNAF 6, but after it grew bigger and bigger, Scott decided to break it off into its own game. For a while, Scott would make updates on Steam and Scott Games, showing us the progress on the game and explaining what each character was programmed to do. I have really fond memories of this era, for whatever reason. Maybe the half year of silence from Scott conditioned the community into wanting more communication. Either way, I feel this was a time of calm in the community. At that point, we knew the story was over and all that Ultimate Custom Night would be was a fun challenge game to cap off the series. Speaking of which, it's funny how the seventh game in the series is a custom night, while the seventh night of most of the games is also a custom night. Makes the series look like one big FNAF game. Anyways, tangent aside, this game released without much of note happening along the way. I suppose Scott and Daco made a deal, that if Daco could beat 5020 mode, Scott would come onto the FNAF show for an interview. Obviously, since I think I've taken quotes from that video in every entry of the series, we know that Daco eventually beat it. But with the exposition aside, we can get into the game and the lore that it presents. For the first time in quite a while, this game has easter eggs that have lore relevance to them, which we'll cover first. Then there are the voice lines in this game, many of which tell us the story of what this custom night really is. And that's mostly it for the lore sources in this game. There are fun cutscenes that play after reaching certain point thresholds, but from my analysis, only one of them is lore relevant. I know some people may say the Toy Chica cutscenes relate to how William killed his victims, but I don't really see it. So, starting with the notable easter eggs, there are just a couple in this game worth mentioning. Firstly, if you cycle in Freddy's difficulty to 1, and everyone else to 0, you can use the death coin on him, which doesn't work out too well for you. Most obviously, he turns into Fredbear, seemingly confirming the long-standing theory that Golden Freddy used to be a Fredbear suit. Furthermore, when he kills you, distorted voice lines play, which are certainly interesting, but none of them are too lore relevant. Next, and more importantly, you can rarely see a ghastly, distorted face staring at you. This is widely believed to be the spirit of Golden Freddy, also known as the Vengeful Spirit. We'll cover this more later. Rarely on your desk, characters from FNAF World appear. This may seem insignificant, but there are strong FNAF World connections in this game, which I see as completely relevant. The most notable of which being our next and final easter egg, Old Man Consequences. This guy right here was an NPC from FNAF World I've never talked about. In that game he would appear if you descended too deep into the glitchy worlds beneath FNAF World, and he'd ask you to sit with him for a while. You can also drown yourself in his lake, which is disturbing. Anyway, setting his difficulty to 1 and successfully catching a fish sends you to his lake once more. He tells you to leave the demon to his demons and to rest your own soul as there is nothing else. This connects to a theme you'll see explored in the voice lines that on Ultimate Custom Night, we're playing as Afton in the hell that HRY promised he'd be sent to. Some also think it may be a coma induced by the vengeful spirit of Golden Freddy. Again, all of this would make more sense as we continue on. The reason why I mentioned the significance to FNAF World is keep in mind, back in my FNAF 4 video, 
I make the assertion that FNAF World is one of two things, a coma or an afterlife, either of these things being possible candidates for what Ultimate Custom Night is, the epicenter of it all being this realm. Old Man Consequences Lake. People have noticed that the disturbing background noise heard here when sped up sounds like William crying out for Henry or Michael to save him. I don't know if this is actually what's being said here, or if it's just an illusion of some kind, but it's interesting nonetheless. Anyways, you can still drown in the lake here, and when you do, something interesting happens. Sure, your game crashes, but also if you have FNAF World installed, but have not even a second of gameplay, opening the game shows that you have the same trophy you would get from the ending of the lake in that game. Clearly there's a connection here. Maybe Old Man Consequences Lake is the middle ground between Heaven and Hell, represented by FNAF World and Ultimate Custom Night respectively, or alternatively, if you believe both are actually comas. Maybe Old Man Consequences represents the deep unconscious lying inside of everyone, an unconscious voice that wants nothing more from us than rest. I mean, in FNAF World, Old Man Consequences can be seen as the punishment for literally going too deep into the game. In Ultimate Custom Night, he seems to represent the punishment for the spirit of Golden Freddy taking things too far and refusing to move on. Anyways, with all of that aside, let's get into the voice lines. There are a ton in this game, so I only mention the relevant ones. Firstly, I'm going to go through the ones that seem relevant to the timeline's past. The others are under my protection. The others are like animals, but I am very aware. What's interesting here is the puppet says that it's very aware while the others are more primitive. Kind of connecting back to what Phone Guy says in FNAF 2 about the puppet always thinking. He also said that the others are under their protection. An interesting plot detail. <laughs> Chica mentions here she was the first, implying the spirit inside of her was the first victim in the NCI. In the troll game released before Ultimate Custom Night, there's a part where Freddy says, Chica, you have lore relevance, to which Chica responds, the fandom will be so happy. I just thought this would be a funny fact to mention. Continuing on, some of the nightmares have interesting lines where they seem to imply exactly what I stated in my sister location video. They were all illusions created by Afton's misdeeds. In this ballpark, some of the non-canon nightmares have lines implying that they are beings manifested by the ventral spirit, or as a reflection of what Afton has done. I am remade, but not by you, by the one you should not have killed. I am your wickedness, made of flesh. This time, there is more than an illusion to fear. Something I wanted to mention about Nightmare in specific is he says that he is Afton's wickedness made of flesh, perhaps confirming my theory that Nightmare was a successful result of the FNAF 4 tests. Alright, with that covered I want to talk about the lines relating to our specific situation in Ultimate Custom Night. Three of the five mediocre melodies have a creepy, uncharacteristic line where in the background you can hear someone else's voice as if someone's talking through them. He tried to release you. He tried to release us. But I'm not gonna let that happen. I will hold you here. I will keep you here. No matter how many times they burn us. This is how it feels. And you get to experience it over and over and over again. Forever. I will never let you leave. We've only just begun. I will never let you leave. I will never let you rest. Some characters have lines referencing the one you should not have killed, like the another name for our vengeful spirit. I have seen him, the one you shouldn't have killed. He's here and always watching, the one you shouldn't have killed. Finally, before I synthesize everything that we've learned, I need to mention the final cutscene of Ultimate Custom Night. In this cutscene, we're met with the scene of a black void with Golden Freddy sitting in it, rustling around in an unnerving way, before he fades into the darkness. I also wanted to mention Mr. Hippo here, he has no lore in his voice lines, but all of them are super cute stories he tells like an old man. 
and as such, he's become quite the cultural icon in the community. So yeah, that's really it. The story for this game is pretty simple and will only really take up one slot on the timeline. Thanks to the final cutscene with Golden Freddy, and the fact that you're punished for trying to death coin him, people have concluded that what this game is, is a hellish eternity orchestrated by the spirit possessing Golden Freddy, to keep William suffering forever. The animatronics that attack you in this game are all controlled by this spirit, and sometimes it speaks through them, referring to itself as the one you should not have killed. People have often read super far into this phrasing, and are confused about why, of all of the kids William killed along the way, why Golden Freddy is the one he messed up with. To set the record straight, I really don't think this line means anything further than the fact that the Golden Freddy child was the only one angry enough to keep tormenting William like this. I feel in a way, this game gives an open ending to how the original story ends, which hinges around the scene with Old Man Consequences. Whether the vengeful spirit ever took his advice and let go remains a mystery, but I kind of like it that way. Mystery is what this series is about, right? I personally like the idea that this scene with Golden Freddy takes place in the physical world of the game. It gives me similar vibes that the Bill Cipher ending image of Gravity Falls did. I don't think in our real world a Golden Freddy suit is hiding somewhere or waiting to be found, but maybe in the world of the games, even still around the time that Security Breach takes place. The Golden Freddy suit still sits restlessly in an abandoned warehouse or Freddy's location, never to be disturbed again, wrestling around in its own anguish. Going to the timeline, there really isn't much to add. Even still, note the Ultimate Custom Night stuff will be indicated with the color black. For the one and only Ultimate Custom Night event, we can go all the way to the end, after the happiest day, where this game takes place. An eternity of torment for William, and an eternity of unrest for the vengeful spirit. If you come back again next week, not only will I be releasing a video explaining my full timeline, but also I'll be releasing all of the files used to make the timeline into the wild. You can all build your own. Now I just want to briefly touch on all of the previous videos in the series and amend any mistakes or point out alternate interesting conclusions from my own, as pointed out by some of you in the comments. Starting with FNAF 2, all I wanted to mention here is Hexadecimal pointed out to me. I accidentally gave some misinformation. Specifically, it turns out Shadow Freddy doesn't actually crash your game. Only Shadow Bonnie does. Shadow Freddy and Endo 2 have an unused sound file called Metal Run, which was apparently supposed to be used at some point but went unused. Anyways, that's all for 2. In 3, I added to the book counter for the first and only time, saying that the phantoms can only be solved through the books. People have told me though that really, the phantoms aren't all that important, so adding to the counter wasn't really necessary. Also, you may technically be able to figure out that they're caused by Springtrap, on the account that they don't appear until Springtrap shows up, so I'm going to set our book counter back to zero. I mentioned that I believe that the Between Night cutscenes must take place before one, since Phone Guy is alive to mention the ceiling of the back rooms. This idea also goes well with my theory that the reason Foxy is so beat up in one is because he has no spare parts, unlike the others, and William has torn them all up at this point. Reddit user Lord Thomas Blackwood pointed out to me that the Tales from the Pizzaplex epilogue show that the safe rooms could still be accessed after they were sealed, as they could open from the outside but strangely not from the inside. To be honest, I've always thought that Scott just made a series of mistakes in 3, as taking everything in as it stated, the story is put in a paradoxical situation where it seems to be the case that Afton destroys the animatronics after the events of 1, hence why all of their endoskeletons are gone as of 3. Even still, Phone Guy was still alive to bring up the sealed off safe room. I think this details how Scott amended this error. As such, on my timeline, I'm going to merge the events of Foxy being destroyed and Remnant being created, and also move the FNAF 3 minigame stuff to be after the events of 1. I'm unsure whether or not I should add to the book counter for this, so come to your own conclusions on if the books are necessary in this instance. May I just comment though that this is a weird way to make a sealed off room. It's almost as if they wanted someone to get trapped in there. On to 4 now, or more so a theory I made parallel to 4. Well in that theory I said that the shadows, and by consequence, nightmare, were conjured from fear. Other people have pointed out that the Fazbear Frights books show entities being conjured by agony. 
While I agree this could be the case here, I also think that fear as it works in this universe could just be a subtype of agony. But I won't add it to the book counter either. Moving on to FNAF 6, I totally forgot to add to the timeline the fact that Fazbear Entertainment supposedly fizzles as a company when HRY ends everything. The only other mistake or alternate perspective people have brought up that I've found interesting is the idea that Midnight Motors is actually the story of how Golden Freddy Child was lured to their death. I mean, I guess it's possible, but I don't know. It feels weird that the newspaper in one would indicate that five children went missing at Freddy's if one of them was actually taken from home. And furthermore, I don't really see any organic way to make the mound be significant if Midnight Motorist is about this family we've never heard of before. I will concede to the fact though that in the files, the orange guy or yellow guy or whatever you want to call him is called Big Man, likely debunking the idea that they're Mrs. Afton. And just to bring them up one more time, I think I may have very well proven my point that the story, at least to a reasonable degree and also only up to Ultimate Custom Night, can be solved without needing the books. That's not to say they aren't worth reading, I personally like the Fazbear Frights books, as they reminded me of my days of reading Goosebumps as a kid. That aside, I think the point I'm trying to make is that most of the lore given to us in the books are really just pointers in the right direction, and not facts to depend on. I will say, the books are important in the field of giving us more depth to things. For example, the Silver Eyes trilogy gives us more insight into the relationship between William and HROI, who by consequence is given a full name in those books, Henry Emily. Also given a name in the books are the child who possessed the puppet, Charlie, and the child who possesses Golden Freddy, Cassidy. In the books, Cassidy is said to be a girl, and even in Ultimate Custom Night, the vengeful spirit has a feminine voice. Even still, they're referred to as a he. As I said, the gender really never mattered too much in the series. Also on the topic of the books giving depth, the date of the MCI is given, being 1985. While that's cool information to have, the story can still be put together without it. And now to answer the elephant in the room. Why is this the end? Well put simply, to make the series work as well as it did, I relied on the fact that the original FNAF story has had years to marinate, and we've gotten answers to most things after having time to think on them. The new game story though is still unfolding, so I don't think I have that vantage point right now. Also, while I never expressly stated this, the target audience for the series has been people who dropped out of the fanbase between the releases of certain games and are now trying to pick back up where they left off. I think this is more applicable to the old games than the new, but I don't see the point in that either. Maybe a long time from now I'll do a quote unquote season 2 of the series. In the meantime, I'll likely be joining the conversation more frequently of solving the mysteries given to us on the Steel Wool Saga, so stay tuned for that. I want to give one last thank you to everyone who supported me with the series and beyond. When I released episode 1, I never imagined I would have gotten so much attention. I'm still in shock so many people are watching and thoroughly enjoying what I do, so it seriously means a lot. But as I said, this series ends for now. Come back next week to check out my full explanation of the timeline. But that aside, thank you all for taking this journey with me. Bye bye! Subscribe to Crazy Samurai.